This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Forget the frustration of picking commerce platforms when you switch your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling wherever you sell. With Shopify, you'll harness the same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash tech. Cross the Brazos and Waco, ride hard and I'll make it by dawn. Cross the Brazos and Waco. Welcome to the Waco History Podcast. I'm Randy Lane, great-grandson of Waco architect Roy E. Lane. Over 100 years ago, he designed the Alico Building, Hippodrome, and other well-known landmarks. My co-host, Dr. Stephen Sloan of Baylor's Oral History Institute, is helping me learn Waco's known and unknown stories. On today's show, iconic Waco photographer Fred Gildersleeve. Gildersleeve was Waco's go-to photographer in the early 1900s. The best record of Waco before the 1953 tornado was captured by Gildersleeve's lens. We can see many elements of the city, its social life, its people, its places, its things. Jeff Hunt, audio and visual curator at the Texas Collection, tells us how he got started, what he's most known for, and some hidden nuggets about his personal life. Somehow he pulled the trigger and his thumb was right in front of the barrel and he literally blew it off. Come with us on a journey into Waco's past. We have our very first guest on the show. Yeah, I'm excited. Jeff, if you could kind of introduce yourself and kind of tell us who you are. I'm Jeff Hunt. I'm the audio and visual curator at the Texas Collection, Baylor University. I am in charge of our photograph collection. Fred Gildersleeve is is an example of a uh, commercial photographer. We ended up with his collection. We have a couple thousand pieces, all sorts of different formats. We've got a very wide array of photographic material uh, at the Texas Collection, Baylor University. Excellent. So today we are talking about Fred Gildersleeve. So for those who don't know who he is, could you kind of explain him? Fred Gildersleeve was born in 1880 near Boulder, Colorado. He... After his father passed away the, the next year, 1881, his, his father was a captain in the Union Army during the Civil War. He fought for a Missouri company. After his death, the family moved to Missouri and Illinois and in that general area, Midwest. He was influenced in those early years by the gift of a Kodak box camera, a cheap, well, you know, consumer camera. He was given that, learned how to use it, would sell photographs to his classmates, and sort of decided he could make a living off of this thing eventually. So in 1902, 1903, he went to the Illinois College of Photography in Effingham, Illinois, where he learned the art of printmaking, use of light, aperture, the the general use of a real camera. The camera that he used is it's what we call now a view camera, a field camera. If anybody's familiar with Ansel Adams, it's the sort of camera he used. A lot of people call it box camera because it did fold up into a box, had bellows, had um, ad- adjustable positions. Uh, it could it could take architectural photographs, landscape portraiture for people. So after he graduated from Illinois College of Photography in Effingham in 1903, after marrying Florence Boyd, he eventually made his way down to Waco. We have a few sound bites about Gildersleeve from Waco historian Roger Conger. Gildersleeve left his photos and negatives to Conger before he passed away in 1958. Here's Conger talking about Gildersleeve's talent with a camera. He was a square peg in a square hole from the beginning. I don't know what motivated him to go to photography school in his earliest days, but around the turn of the century, he attended what apparently was a very well-qualified school of photographic science up in Missouri. He retained, and I guess they're in the pictures that I put in the local history or in the Texas collection, 
he had studies that he had made in those early days of flowers like a pansy or like a lizard sitting on the rail of a fence and things of that kind, still lifes and remarkable photographs that he had done at an early age which showed that he had a tremendously sensitive and artistic bent for photography at its best. He got away from that more arty type of photography when he went into the area of commercial and even portrait photography. And he was up to date on the latest photographic methods at that time, and Waco was booming. Uh, it was growing immensely in that time, 19, uh, 1900s, 1910s. So it was, a, it was a right man for the right time, right place. Is yeah. that what drove him to come to Waco, was that it was kind of booming at the time? That's that's a good question. We, <laughs> we have record of him being in Texarkana, Texas, or Arkansas, uh, making his way from Texarkana to Waco. We don't know the exact influence. His sister, Jessie Ellen, was a, an osteopath. She had an office in the Provident Building in downtown Waco, and she worked for an osteopathic surgeon, later ran a business out of her home on Ethel Avenue. She may have been the influencing factor of Fred Gildersleeve coming to Waco. And so once he got here, what kinds of things was he doing, and, and how did he get started and, and get to know the people he got to know? He was a, a member of several organizations, Rotary Club, Young Men's Business League, the Ad Club. He was excellent in networking and promoting the city of Waco. He, through the Ad Club and the Rotary Club, they would actually go on trade excursions. And this is, you know, eventually not right away, but after he got established in the 1910s, they would go on trade excursions and promote by rail, promote the city of Waco promote events like the Texas Cotton Palace. So what I'm interested in, in today's technology, taking a picture is a pretty simple process. All of us have cameras in our pockets. And even if you have like a nice camera, you can still take a digital image pretty easily and see it on your computer. What was the process back then and what kind of setup did he have to have when he was going from place to place? Sure. He had what we call now, like I said, a, a view camera, also called a field camera, but Back in that time period, it was the format for professionals. The bigger the camera, the better during that time period. They didn't have the luxury of enlargers where use a 35 millimeter camera, enlarge the image to a 5 by 7 or 8 by 10 through the uh, enlarging process in the darkroom. With the large format photography, if you wanted to create an 8x10 print or something that has that sort of detail, you had a negative that was 8x10 inches too. So if, if, if the Exactly. If the negative was 8x10 inches or even 11x14 in some cases, then the camera that holds that mm -hmm. very large plate and in the early years of his photography it was glass plate so you had a this massive dry plate negative in the back of the camera and then you had a lens not like the lenses we use today and you also had a frosted image that was basically his viewfinder how he focused his his image and what he was looking at was an upside down representation of the subject matter and that it was not only upside down, but it was also reversed. <laughs> and on top of that, if you had bright sunlight that you were struggling against, that made the image very difficult to see and, and frosted glass. So you had to get a drape that was attached to the back of the camera, stick your head underneath the drape and do that in the dark. <laughs> so once you focus the image, you appeared from underneath this black covering and then you activated the shutter but there there are lots of steps in between there for instance with the view camera it's a technical camera too so you can frame the photograph uh, ansel adams has a technique he calls visualization where the light 
and the contrast on the subject come into play. And you look at that, but there's also the technical aspect of like the Alico building, for instance. He had to get the entire Alico building in a vertical image. With those cameras, they're perspective control cameras. Uh, that's not what they're called, but rise of the focal plane in the lens and fall, meaning that you can rise the focal point in the photograph to a higher elevation to square the image. Mm. Uh, the vertical and the horizontal lines are much more truer to the subject matter in a view camera because you have the ability to keep, say, a skyscraper vertical and it doesn't look like a pyramid. Right. Sort of like today's cameras. You take a picture of a building and it sort of elongates it and distorts it. So the use of the rise and fall feature on the view camera that he used allowed him to frame the subject, keep it in perspective, and take a picture of something very large and make it as square and true as an architectural drawing would be, as a draftsman would pin it. It's a very technical process. And with the equipment that he was using, you could put a lot in those viewfinders and, and literally rise the focal plane of the image with the ability to rise the the lens uh, through an adjustable lens board. The accordion, the bellows mm -hmm. action of the camera allows the, the lens to tilt, shift, rise, and fall, kind of like an accordion. So you, you have more control of it. That's really interesting. I don't know much about historical cameras, mm -hmm. but I do take photos myself and okay. have done architecture and stuff. And we call it keystoning. I don't know if that's exactly. a, a term that's used. It is. And I just fix it in Photoshop. But you know, yeah, back sure. in the day, you had to make sure you yeah. had it exact. I know he did some night photography, but mm -hmm. for the most part, he's restricted to working during the day. Is that true? Depending on the subject. Now, the Alico building, yes. The Texas Cotton Palace main building, he took excellent photographs of the Texas Cotton main building at night. Mm. It is illuminated. He used a long exposure time. He has also taken photographs of Austin Avenue at nighttime. And you can see the light trails in the background uh, showing that he left his shutter open for maybe more, a minute or more. So, yes. And he also was an expert in the use of flash powder to illuminate an image like Prosperity Banquet in 1911. He used several charges of flash powder to illuminate several tables joined together running down Fifth Street spanning Austin and Franklin Avenue yeah, with about 1,200 yeah. people mm -hmm. seated. He used flash powder on the awnings of the buildings. <laughs> it was a matter of timing. Uh, you had to time those detonations of the flash powder and click the shutter and it, it's sort of like capturing a lightning strike at the same time. <laughs> it, it all, there was no automatic flash like we have now. That, that wasn't available back then, especially when the flash was, it, it was a, quite a process. His days in college in, in Effingham, Illinois, uh, he learned those processes. He learned how to time. He learned the mixture of those combustible powders and chemicals to make them work because you would buy the raw material and you would mix up powder and you could make it as strong or weak as you wanted to. Mm -hmm. Like with a lot of flash photography back in those days, say for instance, people photographing banquets. Now you, you can use a flash to help illuminate a photograph. Sometimes you really don't need it, but you really, with people, you don't want to have them sit for a minute. So you want to get that picture and he, inside interior shots and auditoriums, for instance, there, there are examples where he placed the flash powder up on the rafters and he timed the flash powder explosions and their purpose was to illuminate, not to do anything beyond that. But some of the, the ill effects of that are flash powder on the rafters, what ends up in the rafters. <laughs> and that all comes crashing down on people dining and in people's meals. <laughs> I've seen records of photographers just bolting out the door after those events happen. Mm. They do their job and then they get 
out of there. A flash powder in an enclosed building like an auditorium would. And the smoke, too. You don't get that rise as much indoor. But outdoor with flash powder, some of it goes up into the atmosphere. But still, if people are eating a meal, there's no telling what they might get <laughs> on their plate. Yeah, because this is so a high-class affair. It, it is. Yeah. It, it really is. It's during this period, uh, the Prosperity Banquet that you mentioned, you know, I think of him as experimenting with photography and doing new things. Mm -hmm. If you could talk a little bit about this very famous print of the Cotton Palace. Sure. He photographed the Texas Cotton Palace main building. The Texas Cotton main building was, at the time, it was, it set a world record among photo prints being 120 inches wide. Wow. A representative from Eastman Kodak actually came down from New York and delivered the roll of paper that it needed to, to process that. And as far as how you, the, the use of negatives and the, the contact printing and that, I don't have the mechanics of that. All we have for the record is the photographic paper used, but I would love to find out more about some of those technical aspects. Fred Gildersleeve later sold that photograph for $50. <laughs> and if I'm not mistaken, I believe it was sold to Roy Lane. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I believe that's that's. <laughs> Randy may have it. Yeah, that, yeah I have to check the archives. We'll see if <laughs> but, but it's it in someone's would, attic somewhere. But it would make sense. I don't know if he designed the building or... Um, he did design he the did, building. He did, yeah. Okay, okay. That's, uh, that makes sense. So who else but the architect of the Texas Cotton Palace. Again, let's listen to Roger Conger talk about the Cotton Palace print. Oh, he told me lots of stories about it. He didn't go on and on, but on specific things like his making that largest print that had ever been made of the main building of the Texas Cotton Palace. He was proud of that and liked to tell about the fact that he conceived the idea that he was going to enlarge a picture 10 feet long. And he did, and he built a vat and hold a hypo and uh, informed the Eastman people of his plans. And instead of scoffing at it, they sent a man down from Rochester with a bolt, as I called it, of film for the reproduction. And they worked together and they produced the largest print that had ever been produced in America at that time. And it was a beautiful print. I wish we had it now. It was shown in ex exhibits all across the United States and helped to make Gildersleeve faint. So in doing that, Fred Gildersleeve promoted the city of Waco through the Cotton Palace, which was a huge event. And in its lifetime, it brought millions of people to Waco. It helped with industry, the cotton industry. It helped with just the, the growth of the city. And it was a very important event that was going on to promote cotton. Cotton was king in this part of the state, this part of the country. And the Texas Cotton Palace featured everything from relics from the battlefields of the Western Front during World War I. So about 1916, you could go into their exhibit building and see actual German biplanes that were shot down, mortar the expended shells uh, that were found in Verdun, France. This massive hall of photographs that showed the trenches in France in World War I. The, the print itself was huge for the photographic industry and to promote Fred Gildersleeve's abilities. He would make trips uh, to Eastman Kodak in New York, find out the latest methods in photography mm. and developing. He kept up to date with information. Mm. Back then, you know, there were trade publications, photography magazines, but he felt the need to actually go to these places. Was this early in his career that he took this photo or was this later? When did he become like the guy in Waco? Well, this photograph was taken in 1916. It was kind of midway in World War I. So it was a huge promotion. His technical expertise was, was really exhibited in this photograph. But even prior to that, his work with the local business organizations, the, the Young Men's Business League, the forerunner to the Waco Chamber of Commerce, him being a, a charter member of that, 
enabled him to get in touch with people who own businesses and business people. He was commissioned to do commercial photography by those businesses, trade uh, publicity promotionals for the city of Waco. Uh, a promotional for the city of Waco would include maybe the uh, the Riggins slash Raleigh building. It would include the Alico building. It would include the Cotton Palace, Austin Avenue. It would make people want to come to Waco, seeing this promotional literature that was sent out. And Fred Gildersleeve took all of the photographs and the promotionals. Mm -hmm. So it was what people were seeing in Canada of Waco. So he was getting worldwide recognition in the early 19-teens through commercial and business ventures such as this. He got his name out pretty, pretty quick through his, his network and his connections. Did he have any competitors in town? Because I feel like when I've seen historical photos of Waco, mm -hmm. it always says Gildersleeve in the bottom. So I'm like, was there anybody else? Wayne Farmer, okay, who had a son, uh, another, there was another Wayne Farmer, W-H-A-Y-N-E. He was a competitor. There's also another gentleman, last name of Thompson. So there's but quite a few. There, there are, but his work survived and if the originals didn't survive like the negatives or the original prints or duplication those trade publications survived mm -hmm. he and and his newspaper photographs too he was published in the waco news tribune mm -hmm. the the newspapers of that period and the tribune herald later on yes there were other commercial photographers but not of this magnitude ah. and i think historically waco is really booming these first 30 years of the 20th century so there's a lot of business yeah we want to mention the book so the texas collection just with the texas collection there's a new book they're putting out gildersleeve photographs but I'd love to ask from the early period, Jeff, uh, some other iconic kind of images. One I think about is the biplane that, that he photographed uh, with the Alico building. If you don't mind, are they in the book? Some yeah, are. Yeah, some are. Sure. Get the book. Can, can we look at them and we'll kind of like sure. describe them to people? And now the one you mentioned, Stephen, of Cal Rogers buzzing by the top yeah. of the Alico building in should be 1911. Yeah, 1911. That's got to be some timing, huh? Yes. There was always speculation that that was not real, that Fred Gildersleeve... <laughs> oh, great. Let's um, talk about it. Let's blow the Some lid drama. Up. Okay. Well, th there was speculation that Fred Gildersleeve staged that photograph by superimposing a biplane going by the Alico building. <laughs> the Alico building used to have a very cool observation deck, and people could go up there and see the city of Waco from 22 stories. And when Cal Rogers was making his transcontinental flight from coast to coast many people got on the observation deck and waited for cal rogers to fly by with his it might have been a wright brothers plane i'm not sure but so fred gildersleeve superimposed a biplane and superimposed it in front of the crowd on top of the alico building like they were looking directly at the plane <laughs> flying by so fred gildersleeve photoshopped it <laughs> it's not real. It's not real. I've looked at the image and I've looked at things like, could the camera really pick that plane up in motion like that? And would mm. it be so detailed? Mm. Um, there's no, it's not blurred. It, it was staged pretty well. Now that may have actually happened, but to capture it on film like that, I don't know if that's technically possible. From my own experience, it's kind of unrelated, but sort of related. I was a photographer on a, the USS Kitty Hawk. Okay. And we always did an annual photo of all of the planes in the air wing yes. as they approached Mount Fuji. Yes. And so I'd be in the back of a Seahawk, mm -hmm. and then we try and line up all the aircraft. So sure. these are F-18s for the most part, and then we have a, a Hawkeye, uh, a C-130. Mm-hmm. So those are all aircraft that travel at different speeds. The window to get that photo was like a second and a half, maybe. Mm -hmm. And and really, there was only one photo that would actually work, but you'd have to shoot hundreds of frames just <laughs> to get that one. So mm -hmm. I could imagine a plane coming to the Alico building with the technology you've described would be incredibly difficult to get. It would. I wondered, you know, is it even worth talking about those things that I'm finding in his negatives? The reason I know this is because I've found a negative and a print, of course, of the people on top of the building 
in the same position and a photo with the plane and without. And you can cl- clearly see that it's the same. Yeah. It, it is the photograph <laughs> and it was reused. So when you see the original negative, it makes you realize that this was indeed Photoshop because I can prove it from the negative. The negative is not depicting what the print has depicted over the years and it's not depicting what's been published well none of us will tell it'll be our secret okay <laughs> that, that sounds good you know mm-hmm. i don't fault a guy did he actually come by in an airplane to waco cal rogers did yeah. he so yeah, i would say go go for he it he circled I, you know. the alico building he actually <laughs> circled the alico building. He, he did he he did come through waco and he landed in waco so it it did happen and that exact thing probably happened whether one gets it on film or not <laughs> you know it's an excellent promotional image though i will, I will give him that absolutely <laughs> absolutely well because above all else gildersleeve was a businessman i mean he, <laughs> oh yeah he was a mm-hmm. photographer but it's his business that's yeah. right yeah. randy mentioned we've got the book here and i didn't know if there are some images that were some of your favorites maybe mm-hmm. from his earlier period that you'd like to talk about looking through here and it's it's really hard to say which one is your favorite so is it kind of like a your favorite child you don't you don't have one you have you love all the photos that's exactly what it is and there are ones that i'm partial to as well and those are going to be the occupational photographs the construction of the interurban bridge the, the trolley bridge that ran alongside the suspension bridge, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Not many people know what those pylons are that now stand next to the suspension bridge. So that was the trolley bridge? Trolley. It was the the interurban trolley. It was public transportation that eventually made its way into East Waco and way north of East Waco and different towns too. We have photographs of, say for instance, the bridge being built. That also shows the many workers and in the distance in this particular photograph in the transportation section of this book, you can see people cooling down spikes and swinging axes and workers just standing around. And But and also in the background, you can see Bridge Street. You can see an ivy-covered suspension bridge gatehouse, one of the gatehouses. It shows some of Waco that was lost being Bridge Street. So the view that the book shows, showing the, um, the view f- looking west up Austin Avenue, so it was looking from, say, City Hall now, but it, it shows something that just doesn't exist now. It, it shows a, a social history of Waco. You see African-American businesses in the background, the diversity of workers. You see structures that are no longer with us. Also, we're looking at where the Hilton Hotel now stands. Mm-hmm. And, and in a lot of these images, the only remnants left are the bridges. It's really interesting, too, that he's not just showing the completed stuff. He's showing them actually building it. So you can see it's almost a documentarian type of style, right? That's right. I was looking at some um, photographs of the Praetorian building that was being constructed in 1910s. Can't remember the exact year, but the the Raleigh building, pictures of that being constructed, and of course the Alico building, street paving. It it shows construction methods. It shows us the the structure of these buildings, how it looked before they covered it up with brick. Yeah. <laughs> so it it shows the the processes and the Alico building, for instance, and I and I call on that building a lot because it is an amazing architectural feat. 22 stories high when it was completed in 1911. It was the tallest building in the southwestern United States, west of the Mississippi River. It held that title for a very short time. Dallas just grew up exponentially after that. But Waco was known for that Alico building. I read in an old newspaper account somewhere that somebody was asked, you know, they're from Waco, and a question that they normally would get would be what floor do you live on? Yeah. <laughs> Meaning the Alico building. <laughs> it was that well known. People assume you live in the Alico building. <laughs> it was that big. So it, it sounds strange, but it, back in that time period, the 22 story building, you know, the, the late Wilton Lanning used to talk to me about the Alico building quite a bit. And he referred to it as Fred Gildersleeve's 
22 story tripod <laughs> he would say that all the time and then i sometimes i i, I just wasn't focusing on his question too much and i literally thought a tripod but it's the building right um the observation deck was was very very um useful to him up there i wish we still had that why don't we i i do too <laughs> um it shows we're, we're getting pictures of east waco elm street and this would be way out in uh, off in the infinity in the distance. Mm-hmm. So looking at Waco in eastern direction or north, if you use a compass, <laughs> a lot of that comes into focus and we can make out a lot of the grid of the city through those bird's eye views that he took from the Alico building. It was so important that we can trace back a lot of our growth and how the city looked at certain periods of time in the 1910s. And it was amazing looking over at 4th and Franklin Avenue. You had a very large Provident Bank building that sat over there, a Metropole Hotel across the street, Crystal Palace swimming pool. And then over on in the Washington Avenue area, if you were looking from that vantage point from the Alico building, you could see in Fred Gildersley's pictures the equestrian dealers of Washington Avenue <laughs> towards the east, the mule barns, mm. the wagon shops, the horse stables. And these were uh, Washington Avenue over near where the Marriott is now. Mm. It's like going back in time, sort of what Google Earth does for us now. Is there a good image that kind of highlights what you're talking about in the book? Yes, there is. And I So for people who get the book, we want to say page number is what we're talking about. So okay. that one with the construction of the bridge, do you remember what page that was? Yes. It is the beginning of part four, transportation. When we get to these panoramic photographs, they're unmarked, but it's about 219, part four. Now this photograph is interesting in that it shows he actually took the photograph from the bridge facing up Bridge Street. So you get a little bit of the bridge, but you also get the uh, the rail line, the, the installation of the railroad ties and the rail line itself being built. And this particular picture I have here, not showing just the bridge itself, while it shows some of the bridge, it has a lot of in- incidentals in the background, like a, a, one of the, the best pictures of Bridge Street I've seen from mm-hmm. that period. So incidentals is a huge thing with Gildersleeve's photograph because of the the aperture settings stop down so much. Everything is crystal clear in the background. The depth of field is amazing. And also from a photographic technique perspective, it's a really good use of leading lines because the, the rail kind of guides your eye yes. down the photo. It, it, it does. With the, uh, the vertical adjustment of his large format view camera, he could take pictures of railroads, the lines, the rail lines, and shift up like he would shift up with the the bellows. Uh, he would shift up on a rail line, and it's like you're looking down on the railroad tracks, and the lines converge. It's pretty cool. Better when you have a, a rise of the lens and a rise of the focal plane. It allows you to literally grow 15 feet just by switching the (laughs) optical center of your lens and with it hitting the film plane. And so the best way to enjoy this podcast is to get the book. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just to make sure, where can people get the book? It is going to be released September 15. And as far as the official places where people can buy it, uh, the Baylor Bookstore, I have heard mention of Barnes & Noble, various other. I I don't have an actual vendor list, but if anybody wants to inquire, the Baylor University Press would certainly be able to to steer one to um, a vendor. And as we get that information, we'll put it in the show notes to make sure people can get it. Okay, Mm -hmm. so moving along, if we want to see a good example of the photo you're talking about where you can see really far in the distance by being up on the Alico building, Mm -hmm. what image would you suggest they check out in the book? I've got a couple that I put in here. So these are all curated by you? Yes. So that's why it's six pounds, because you couldn't pick yes. which ones you like the best. That, that, that's a good way to look at it. And I, and I wanted to give them more, but uh, we uh, had to cut. The bird's eye view of downtown, page 283, shows looking towards the east. And in the foreground, you can see the Majestic Theater, Vaudeville, two performances daily, and with a price. And you can see that on the side of the building clearly, which is amazing to see Vaudeville and 
Waco, and then the Hotel Metropole and the city square. Now, these photographs show what the city square used to look like. Waco was a little bit unusual. It had city hall in the town square instead of the uh, county courthouse. Hmm. Why that was, I've heard various things, but you can clearly see it in these bird's eye views. You can also see the Waco Suspension Bridge in the background, the former McLennan County Courthouse that stood at 2nd and Franklin Avenue when the, the current one was built in the early 1900s. The 2nd and Franklin McLennan County Courthouse location vacated, so you had an empty courthouse, beautiful building. And the proprietor, owner of Crow Brothers Steam Laundry, Waco Steam Laundry, bought the old courthouse building. And, and you can see that the former courthouse in this photograph, too. We can see how the square looked, how the town developed. Waco very much started at in the area of the Waco Suspension Bridge because it was the first real way to get across the Brazos River. The development of the city went in that direction west of the suspension bridge and to a lesser extent to the east because of the flooding problems which i also have photographed in here they're wonderful wonderful images of the floods good yeah yeah in there yeah i hope they represent it the flood of 1916 was disastrous and what is important to me is to let people see the city before disasters hit it like the tornado because if somebody just discovers historic Waco through Waco tornado photographs taken in 1953, they're not going to know what Waco once looked like before mm -hmm. the storm hit it. And same with the flooding, like Elm Street, most of our older pictures of Elm Street are of Elm Street underwater, mm -hmm. people on boats going down Elm Street. But there aren't a lot of Elm Street before, uh, you know, people had a reason to get out and photograph the aftermath of a lot of these events. So... They're important in that sometimes the only photographs we have to go by are flood pictures, unintended. There are just so many of them out there. But these photographs were taken to promote the city of Waco. To Fred Gildersleeve wanted to show off his skills, his expertise with the camera. These particular bird's eye views, now I know that they there are promotional items out there that have these, but it would be difficult to track down the published material that was published over a hundred years ago that used these images. Probably newspapers, but we just happen to have the original glass plate negatives. We can give them new life with digitization. Same with all this all these items. It's given us given the negatives a new lease, a new way to be seen to a wider audience. So we've seen these couple of photos here. What's a good example of maybe some of his more controversial stuff? That would be the Jesse Washington event that happened in 1916. Fred Gildersleeve was in Waco City Hall, and he was in the courtroom. He knew that um, something was happening, and we don't know exactly how things unfolded, how Fred Gildersleeve knew to be there at that time. We can only speculate as to why the images were, were taken. Now, Fred Gildersleeve is known for his flood pictures. He went down to Galveston in 1915, photographed the aftermath of the Galveston storm, and he sold postcards of the Galveston storm damage. He also sold postcards of Waco Machine and Supply Company, for example, and hotels with photographs on them. So he, he and in some cases, this, the photographic paper was printed on postcards. That's how they did it back then. Uh, with, with the Jesse Washington lynching, now there was a series of photographs taken by Fred Gildersleeve and... How I, my, technically how I think he did it, I think he had his handheld Graflex view camera, which took a smaller format negative, 4x5 or 5x7, so he was able to hold this by hand, and his camera that he used to hang out of airplanes to his portable camera. So Fred Gildersleeve was in City Hall during this time. He, he was there when the mob scene erupted in Waco City Square, and, and I can read direct quotes from the book. I, I think that might help with my, my wording here. Let's go for it. So regarding the Jesse Washington lynching, and we'll just start 
with our quote. Page 11, we, uh, one incident recorded by Fred Gildersleeve that may have clouded the public's perspective of him was his documentation of the Jesse Washington lynching near Waco City Hall on May 15, 1916. Gildersleeve published photographs made into postcards of the event. His intention in photographing the Washington incident is not known, but as a result, the sale and distribution of the photograph of, of the graphic and gruesome act may have helped galvanize the NAACP, National Advancement for the Association of Colored People, into national action against lynching. So his, and, and I, I'll stop reading right there, his photographs were in very important in that it gave graphic evidence of what was going on in the South. So Stephen, if people don't know exactly what the Jesse Washington lynching was, can you kind of explain that in a context? Yeah, so in May of 1916, a, uh, a farm woman in Robinson is found murdered in her seed shed, and suspicion falls immediately on Jesse Washington, which by all accounts uh, now we would say delayed development delayed learning. We, we don't know exactly mm-hmm. what sort of issue they would say Jesse Washington has now, but we know there were some sort of special circumstances regarding to his competency. So suspicion falls immediately on Jesse Washington, and he is taken out of town because there's concern of mob violence. Actually, a mob tries to go and get him that evening, but they had taken him out of town. Within a week, the fastest speedy trial uh, in McLennan County history, he's tried and convicted. And while sentencing is happening in the courtroom, a, a mob grabs Jesse Washington, takes him down the back stairs of the courthouse, McLennan County Courthouse, our current courthouse, begins a, uh, to take him toward the river, then is redirected and takes him toward a tree uh, outside of City Hall. That's uh, at right. the time, and as they take him to this tree for his body to be lynched, burned, dismembered, desecrated, uh, a crowd begins to gather around this, and it becomes a huge public spectacle. And Gildersley, we think, it was in the mayor's office, was his initial perspective on events. And I'd be interested, in Jeff, as you talk about the different perspectives he has. Gildersley was there at the time with his camera. Given the nature of Fred Gildersleeve's work, he could have been there doing anything that was a central business district. So we just don't know for certain. But what we do have are the graphic photographs of the event that were published in the postcards. And they show the body of Jesse Washington on a pyre, flames burning, uh, very graphic. There was um, a dismemberment, and it was a, a very gruesome scene, a very hard, difficult thing to visualize. We do not have the photographs of the incident in the book. Uh, we didn't want children to sort of just come across them, open a page, and it's the sort of thing that I think just was we want to reach an audience, and it's a very disturbing thing to see. So if one wants to see the images. The Library of Congress has them. The print images that we have at the Texas Collection were taken from the crisis supplement. They're scanned from that original primary document that the NAACP published. And the crisis, like I said, published a supplement called it the Waco Horror that talks about this incident. And in that same supplement, are some of probably Fred Gildersleeve's promotional pictures of Waco, of the University of Baylor, of the city of Waco, the buildings, archi- architectural promotional photography, just to, to let people know a little bit about the city of Waco, the population, the percentage of African Amer- African Americans to other groups living there, paint the scene of the city of Waco before they talk about the Jesse Washington incident. Written in the crisis in the supplement, we took a direct quote and put it in the book, and the the quote is, Photographer Gildersleeve made several pictures of the body as well as the large crowd which surrounded the scene as spectators. The photographer knew where the lynching was to take place and had his camera and paraphernalia in the city hall. He was called by a telephone at the proper moment. He writes to us. So this is Fred Gildersleeve's reply back. We have quit selling the mob photos. 
This step was taken because our city dads objected on the grounds of bad publicity. As we wanted to be boosters and not knockers, we agreed to stop all sales. F.A. Gildersleeve. We thought, uh, you know, with, with just the, the graphic nature of the photographs, we wanted to uh, use this primary source information that is available on this incident and put that direct quote that claims to be of Fred Gildersleeve. Uh, we, we just don't know the background to it. He liked the, the, the opportunity, as, uh, as a photographer does today, to photograph things as they happen, and we don't know the intention. But we, we do have is the graphic evidence, the historical evidence, and these were distributed throughout the country, throughout the world. Pictures of this mob lynching this, this young man, and similar to like a Twitter message goes out today. People got it. It's a little bit slower, but once they're published and made readily available, we're looking back on it now. We're finding more information as far as visual quotes like this from this primary material that's available to a lot of us on the web, and, and a lot of people are just now finding out about this incident too, and there's certainly um, written and visual evidence of this to, to show a representation of what was going on. Yeah, we have the images. They're on the app and website, uh, wacohistory.org, where you can go and kind of see those particular images. And Jeff, I think you're point is a good one. We don't know necessarily his motivations for doing them, but we do know how ultimately how historically significant the images are mm. in that a lynching in progress, we just don't have images of lynchings in mm. progress. And so those Gildersleeve images really reveal an ugliness that we don't really have in a lot of the images that we have on lynching. And it, it also mm. reveals an ugliness, but also a um, you know, they're so shocking to look at those images of everyday folks engaged in that act in that time period. And that's why I think it's been those images have endured and Gildersleeve's name is mentioned in relation to these images. I, I think about TV and the civil rights movement in the 1960s and mm -hmm. those images, what they did to, to help the movement move forward. Yeah, sure. And mm -hmm. it's similar to this visual evidence, how important that was how horrible it was, but how important it is to have those images. It's, it's like the Emmett Till in, in the casket published in Jet Magazine, that, that sort of visual impact. And, and that is another example. It, it's not, it wasn't taken while it was happening. It shows the aftermath, and you can see the grieving mother over the coffin. Uh, nothing does more than that visual. It's like it, it puts you there. Mm. To get this while it happened is is very unusual. As bad as it was, it had some positive effects then and, and certainly does now. Mm. There's so many iconic photos, and when I think about the ones that stick with me, they're not always the happy, cheery ones. And I would think also you might get kind of forgotten by history if you only take the good, happy photos, right? Exactly. And, and a lot of what we have of Fred Gildersleeve is his commercial work. We we don't have the negatives of the Jesse Washington lynching, but we what we do have is really educating us on how life once was in this city, in social life and commercial life. So Stephen, you were talking about his divorce being kind of interesting? Yeah, so it may be worth talking a little bit, Jeff, about how the images came to the Texas collection. And of course, with Gildersleeve, there's also the story of what we don't have. There's a bit of a messy divorce. Uh, we're getting into Mr. Gildersleeve's business here, but <laughs> there was a messy divorce. I don't think he'd mind. <laughs> there was a messy divorce at one point, and uh, Roger Conger, who becomes kind of a trustee of Gildersleeve's legacy as far as his photographic legacy uh, estimates that, that we probably have less than there was, about half of what there was as far as photographs. Well, we do, and it makes complete sense that we're not going to have a lot of his work just due to preservation concerns. You cannot store items like negatives in your backyard shed in central Texas or anywhere in the south or anywhere because moisture and you have heat 
In Texas, it can get extremely hot here, as we know. And inside a building that's not climate controlled, it can reach, I don't know, 130s, 40s. So if you've got photographic negatives with a silver uh, a gelatin emulsion that's a chemical basis, a dry plate negative on a glass surface or a cellulose surface, the silver gelatin emulsion is going to heat up and it's going to liquefy. And other glass plates st stacked on top of these are, are going to get heated and they're going to start bonding together. And if the negatives are not broken, they're going to become stuck together just by the elements. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've seen some damage and residue from plates being literally pulled apart, not broken, but emulsion sticking. So in, in a lot of cases, it's not terribly bad because it, in some cases it manages to hit the horizon in the photograph, so it doesn't matter too much. Also, the cellulose negatives get very, they start to disintegrate and smell like vinegar and get what's known as vinegar syndrome, where they become hazmat, basically. They stink, the cellulose film base starts to shrink, and then they start to what, what's called channeling, where the film base shrinks and the silver gelatin emulsion doesn't bond evenly. So there are many uh, preservation issues there. That's why a lot of his negatives aren't still with us. There's also rumor during the time when Fred Gildersleeve and Florence Gildersleeve split up, they, they were never officially divorced, but there was a time in the early 40s when the relationship started to sour. And for years, Roger Conger had mentioned this. He said in one of their disagreements that Florence threw out a lot of his negatives and put them in a dumpster and got rid of his lot of a lot of his photographic record. One more time, let's listen to Roger Conger talk about the photos we've lost. We lost perhaps as much as was retained in the glass negatives. They would not have been perhaps as valuable, except that they would be 50 years from now, but they covered the period of the 40s and the 50s. And during that time, he was photographing more athletic events. He photographed the coming to Waco of the big industries like General Tire and Rubber Company and Owens, Illinois Glass and things of that kind. Oh, and of course, the air bases here and the military installations of the 1940s. I think that may be the case. She probably did get rid of a lot of his negatives because a photographer keeps their personal collection like uh, people keep their documents in a filing cabinet or a thumb drive. Now, with the negatives that I'm talking about, they start to stink if they're in a heated environment and, and they're, they get rancid. They become hazmat. They will make your eyes water like onions will, but a um, hundred times is worse. They're, they become putrid. So I could imagine a situation where Fred and Florence got in a disagreement about his storing negatives. She may have said it's either the negatives or me. And who knows what happened, then it, it starts to happen. Uh, she ends up throwing away and destroying a lot of his negatives. And I don't think it was out of spite. I think it was you had a, a house in the 1940s in Texas that was not climate controlled. The air circulation wasn't there. You had these smelly cellulose negatives rotting. And maybe Fred, during his decades working with photographic materials, was immune to some of this. And, and it's dangerous. It's bad for the eyes. There are nitrate negatives. And, and he was a savvy smoker. So. so that wasn't a good situation. If Florence did get rid of some of his negatives, I, I can understand why. It, it, it goes beyond a marital issue or an angry spouse. And that's my take on it. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm thinking. And yeah. there may have been some drama in there too. And I'm sure there was, but we don't know that. Mm -hmm. yeah. If only there'd been someone there to take a photo. <laughs> exactly. And you know, I think my wife could relate because at one time I said I wanted to make kimchi in the house mm -hmm. and she told me no way. So I can understand <laughs> you have something kind of smelly in there. You're like, Same no, dumpster. get that out yeah. of the house. Same dumpster. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. They didn't know any different as, as far as you know, living in a house without that sort of heat. You left your windows open, your doors open. You had to draft through the house all, all time during the summer. So 
However, a lot of his non-glass did survive. They weren't all destroyed by Florence. There are some out there. We have some at the Texas collection. And this would be his later work. We have cellulose 8x10s going up to the late 1940s. Not every one he took, but a, a representative sample of some of his later work. The majority of it is not out there. We don't have it digitized. That's a, certainly another issue to discuss, but not all of it was destroyed either. Mm -hmm. And not all of it was destroyed due to glass sh uh, shelves breaking in his backyard shed and cr negatives crashing to the ground due to improper storage. That indeed was the case, but the Texas heat, like I said, did its number on the, the chemicals and in, in the negatives. So a lot of them just poor storage and maybe some drama too. So to the best of your knowledge, I want to kind of paint a picture in my head of, of what Gildersleeve was like. So can you kind of tell me about his personality based on things that you've read or things that you've seen? Sure. He was a short man in stature, very thin in his younger years, but he may have been right at about five feet, maybe shorter. And, and I, comment on his height because he was using a very large camera and the camera dwarfed <laughs> him so he was looking up at the ground glass when he was focusing his images like a lot of photographers do with that type of format but he was a very he had a very gregarious big personality he really did um there's a photograph in the book of papio daniel and uh, and also Teddy Roosevelt, and I read written somewhere that he would call the names of politicians before he took their photograph. So Papio Daniel, he might have yelled, hey, Pappy, or something like that, because O'Daniel was smiling in the photograph very broadly. So he, he knew how to capture that reaction. He knew people. He was very likable, from what I've read, very likable guy. He had a great outgoing personality and his mother even made some comments on son you will never be a handsome man <laughs> what you can make make up for though is your carry yourself a certain way in society always be polite and have a good personality and that overcomes a lot of physical disabilities people may have i know in the early years of his career here he was known for riding his motorcycle mm-hmm Herbert Gwynn, his assistant in the sidecar. Mm -hmm. I've seen that picture, I think. Yeah, it, it's kind of an iconic picture of him. I think later he transitioned to a Model T. Mm -hmm. But early on, he started in that motorcycle. So He, he did. He was a, a fan of the Excelsior motorbike. He liked motorcycling. He had a custom-painted sidecar. And he claims to have owned the first sidecar in Waco. And that was a big deal back then. People just don't see sidecars. <laughs> he liked motorcycles. He uh, photographed motorcycle races, which we used to have here in Waco. Automobile races. He liked technology. He was uh, sort of a techie in his day. He, he was up on the latest things. He appreciated mechanics and engineering and he had the money to buy those sorts of things in his dark room i show a picture of him enlarging the 120 inch texas cotton palace main building photograph and the workers are standing around doing the development work and in the background in his studio i can see uh, an advertisement for the excelsior motorcycle pinned up in his studio so that was sort of um, maybe an ambition for him to buy that motorcycle one day. And he did. So I've actually seen his wall decorated with motorcycle pictures, mm. which is unusual for that time period. Typical a man interested in machines and, and, and things of that nature. Do you think he had any sort of, not disorders, but kind of maybe he was on the autism spectrum or something? Yes, I think so. Now what we know about autism, autism spectrum disorders he would be on that on on the the spectrum and i should say autism spectrum with his in, intense interest in cameras photography darkroom technology camera technology everything he did was related to the camera and the lens 
his social life was on young men's business league trips out of town. That's where he socialized. And he wouldn't be there if he wasn't a photographer. It, it kind of got his shoe into a lot of these organizations. Being the, mm. being the man behind the camera, he had a reason to be there. Where today, they, uh, with autism, the, they're usually not social people. And he had a reason to be social. His fixations on certain things, uh, his, his intense interests. So yes, he what 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 they call today autism if if he had anything of that nature he he fits a lot of those molds that we know of of that and you mentioned we were talking about hobbies as well or these things as personality i know he, he was a hunting and fishing but a lot of that was about photography as well he was a hunter he he was and he liked uh he was a sportsman and he was an outdoorsman somebody born in 1880 in Colorado and living in the Midwest, had to hunt to find food. Times were much different then, so it wasn't a hobby. It was more of a, um, it was a necessity. You had to do it. He did have a hunting accident. The old story goes is that he, in the dark room when he was using chemicals for developing photographs, Hypo ate his thumb off. He always claimed Hypo is a necessary chemical in the dark room and if you did get a lot of exposure at may i don't know what would happen but he he blew his thumb off on a hunting incident <laughs> where he his rifle he was leaning his rifle up against the fence and he was steadying it and somehow he pulled the trigger and his thumb was right in front of the barrel and he literally blew it off and they had to amputate it and his bone shattered. It's in the Waco Tribune Herald, uh, September 1928, when this happened. Uh, and it happened in a dove hunting trip to, to Leroy, Texas, just near west, just up the road. Maybe it was sort of like a Dick Cheney type thing where he, unless you're in that position, it's, it's, it's really not going to get out there. But he, he wasn't going to admit it. Yeah, uh, you know, it was, a, it was an accident. It was a hunting accident. So it was maybe not so good to be appearing like you couldn't handle your weapon back then. Is that the idea? That is ex exactly, I think, his mindset. It it didn't look good. It's better to say you just worked too hard. That's right. And it made you lose your thumb. Uh, that's right. I, I think that's it. Adds more drama to it. As you talk about his personality and some of his habits, uh, one of the things I've heard is some unsavory sort of personal habits he had, vices, let's say that he had that uh, were in some of his personal journals and things like that. And I know you've worked with the, the archives. Have you run across any of his writings on some of this? I had mentioned the, um, the document that he wrote in the hotel room in about 1943 where he makes some personal accounts of his life over the years and what his mother told him, and he's looking back on things. And it might have been, been about this time as... He split from his wife, and he's real introspective. He was a, a, a drinker, and he liked um, alcoholic beverages. And but I, and I, think, I think there I think were also was, illegal substances that, or may we may think of as illegal substances that that he used or that he admitted to using. And and we'll qualify this by saying he was probably in a really dark place when he's making these confessions in the early 1940s. But mm -hmm. uh, I've heard rumor that some of this is in that. Uh, source material. Yeah, there are some things out there that he wrote about himself in this document. He talks about using a certain prescription drug. Should have been a controlled substance at the time, but he became, I guess, dependent or used this pill. I, I cannot remember the name of this today's medication. It would be like a benzodiazepine or something like that, a stimulant of some sort. And And during that time, the 1910s, when he was using it, I'm sure it wasn't illegal because mm -hmm. um, things were much different. He has admitted to use of um, non-prescribed substances such as that. He also wrote about himself use of marijuana as well. And he learned how to cultivate marijuana seeds when he did some work in Mexico taking pictures of plantation operations in Carmen Campeche, Mexico. He learned about um, from 
the, the local people there in, in that country. And he grew marijuana in his backyard that I've read in personal account of his writings. He did it for a number of years. He claims his wife didn't know, his sister didn't know. And he also makes, and I can't remember the exact quote, but he, he references showing a city official the marijuana plants in his backyard. The city official made the comment to him, you can get away with anything in this city as long as it's not rape or murder. So, Was he talking about him specifically? There was probably some concern about him growing that in his backyard, what the reaction would have been by, because I believe this might have been the chief of police. Mm-hmm. So, But I think he's talking about Gildersleeve in particular could get away with anything. Well, Gildersleeve wrote that. Mm-hmm. And and <laughs> we don't what, know. what that implies, I, I don't know, but it shows a, a human side to yeah. Yeah, and some weakness um, and moral weakness, I guess if you want to call it that, mm-hmm. uh, use of alcohol. He had ways of dealing with uh, the pressures that he was under in his um, personal and business life and the de- demands of um, everyday life. So he was growing it in his backyard and his wife didn't know about it? They're in the backyard, and she's like, uh, what is that? Oh, it's, it's basil. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's right. She was more concerned about the smell in the house <laughs> that's than the right. in the backyard. <laughs> well, there, there were lots of issues with the Gildersleeve family. At about the time that they split up, Florence Gildersleeve's mother moved in with them, and I think there was something going on, and Florence needed the uh, comfort of her mother nearby. Or maybe she was elderly and couldn't manage to to live alone, needed some better means of support. Uh, And she had lived in, I believe, Arkansas. So she moved down. So the mother-in-law moved in with Fred and Florence. This was about 1943. And the two ended up separating. There was never any finalized divorce. We looked, the divorce records were searched in the courthouse. We couldn't find anything. So Florence ended up living on Maple Avenue, I think 1501 Maple Avenue, with her mother. So the two lived separately. They, They were estranged. There was a split. Florence Gildersleeve lived into the 1960s, I believe. And she is buried in Oakwood Cemetery. Fred Gildersleeve is buried in Waco Memorial Park next to his sister, Jesse Ellen Gildersleeve. And he passed away in 58. 58, that's correct. So they're not buried together. The the married Mr. and Mrs. Fred Gildersleeve are not buried together. That's correct. Very interesting. Well, as this whole story, as we've talked about, Fred Gildersleeve shows us that history is a lot more complex and Mm many-sided. Uh, than it is that we think it is at first glance. It it really is. You you never know what you're getting into. You mentioned him taking the photo of the Cotton Palace. Mm-hmm. Was there any record of him being friends with Roy Lane or any stories where they both come up? I can't give you any um, genealogical information that would just blow you away concerning Roy Lane. He was a friend of his. It was business like. Now, any information you find out about your great-grandfather, is that right? That's right. Okay, any information you find out, in some cases, beyond a birth and a death date, anything is good. I mean, absolutely. He was a, certainly a friend of Fred Gildersleeve's, and friend made through business, through Fred Gildersleeve photographing Roy Lane's homes that he designed, his buildings, uh, commercial structures that he designed. He designed the Temple Road of Shalom on Washington Avenue. That is a Roy, that was a Roy Lane design synagogue um, that no longer stands, but Fred Gildersleeve photographed the architectural rendering for Temple Road of Shalom on Washington Avenue. And without him photographing that document, we wouldn't have that now. A photograph of the original or of that particular Bread of Shalom building is significant, but when you get to the architectural record, it's it's a big deal. So Fred Gildersleeve did a lot of duplication of non of reflective material of documents and things like that. But um, he would have went with Roy Lane on trade excursions to promote the city of Waco. Sometimes they would take a rail line straight up to Canada with many stops in between. It was a time for 
them to get together and enjoy themselves and each other. I'm going to assume that he was a good friend of your great-grandfather, Roy Lane, uh, Roy E. Lane, who's a significant architect for the city of Waco, and we still have a lot of his influences today. Getting to know Fred Gildersleeve can help you maybe understand how things were for your, your great-grandfather's generation, maybe. Fred Gildersleeve left a photographic record for us. We can see uh, many elements of the city, its social life, its people, its places, its things. His motto is, photographs tell the story. That was his advertising slogan. So photographs do tell the story. He certainly has left great photographic evidence for us to look at today. Well, and y'all have done good work with the book and in, in putting it in front of new audiences. I know you had to make hard choices from the 1,500 choices that you could have made. Sure. Uh, but it's a great, uh, great book. Thank you. So if people want to pick that up, they'd go to the Baylor Bookstore, and then we'll find other locations where they may be. Put them in the show notes. I'm going to visualize it for people who can't see. It's six pounds. It's huge. It's one of those great books that if you are someone from Waco, you're going to want to have on your coffee table for sure. That, that's <laughs> right. I, I scanned about 120 glass plate negatives for this book. I scanned more, but 120 were published. So a lot of these are from that medium and it will say what I scanned it from whether the print or the negative so people can actually see for themselves what I'm describing and formulate their own opinion based on what we've um, published out there and and I hope people enjoy these as much as we do and have over the years and are maybe seeing these in a different light as well uh, very very interested to see the public's reaction in, in our work well, my uncle is a huge Gildersleeve fan, so I know Good. what I'm getting him for Christmas already. <laughs> uh, I'm very <laughs> pleased to hear that. I think that's wonderful. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I've learned a lot about Gildersleeve and also like how photos worked back then. It's just so intriguing to me as someone who takes photos now to know the process that people had to go through and that the kind of talent he had to hone that art. Absolutely. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. Thank you. Cross. Thanks for listening to the Waco History Podcast. Like what you heard? Subscribe, rate, and review our show on iTunes so we can reach more listeners. You can find show notes and info on every episode at wacohistorypodcast.com and more info on Waco's past at wacohistory.org. Our theme music, used with permission, is Cross the Brazos at Waco, performed by the late Billy Walker. For more info on Billy's music, go to billywalker.com. We'll see you next time. time ago, as he dropped the guns that she hated in the muddy Brazos below. Cross the Brazos and wake home, ride hard and I'll make it by dawn. Cross the Brazos and wake home, I'll walk straight in old San Antonio. Then the night came alive with gunfire He knew that at last it'd been found As the ranger's badge showed brightly El Bandito lay on the ground Carmela knew he was dying That all of her dreams were in vain As she kissed his lips for the last time she heard him whisper again Cross the Brazos and Waco Ride hard and I'll make it by dawn Cross the Brazos and Waco I'm safe when I reach San Antonio I'm safe when I reach San Antonio